Well, good morning, Westmount Congregation, and all those who are following us on our uh, social uh, media, on YouTube and uh, Facebook. We're glad you're with us this morning. Um, I, you can't see it from here, but we have a number of cheery masked faces out there who are glad to be here. We're keeping the light and the warmth of this place open. And if you should feel so inclined, please come and join us. We still have uh, lots of space. We just wish, we just ask that you would register by Thursday morning uh, with our church administrators so we have an idea of who is coming. We begin our service this morning with the words from Psalm 19, and I'm reading verses 7 to 9. And this is what the psalmist writes. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. And the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Thanks be to God. Praise be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of life, by your gracious invitation, you have brought us out of our homes into this sanctuary so we might experience the warmth of your love for us, experience the truth of it, the justice of it, the beauty of it. May your spirit gather with us now that our eyes might see and our ears might hear the word of life from Jesus. And in what we have seen and heard, we pray we might become in our relationships with one another. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Well, friends, by way of introduction, uh, I just want to say in this morning's gospel that you're uh, about to hear from chapter 22 of Matthew, um, a lawyer of the Mosaic religious law on behest of the Pharisees who were at that time, Jesus' adversaries, because this takes place after he's entered Jerusalem, just six days or so before he is uh, put to death on the cross. And the lawyer asked Jesus the question, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? So let us hear the question and Jesus' response and consider the implications for our life with God and one another his response. And this is what is written in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. Matthew 22, 34 to 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, and one of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this, the Lord said, Love your neighbor as yourself. For all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is the gospel of Christ for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. O oh Lord, the words that you just spoke to us, they have grace to disturb us, grace to console us, and grace to save us. Help us to know your grace in these words of life today. Amen. Well, friends, the, uh, the lawyer, the lawyer poses the question to Jesus in this short 
In the short scripture that I just read, Rabbi, what is the greatest commandment? And the question itself, in the context in which it is uh, asked, of course, is an adversarial one. But the question itself is also understood to be the greatest question of life for a faithful Jewish person to ask themselves, both as individuals and as a, as a community before God. And the person, he or she, was required to ask it of themselves, somewhere in their prayer life, to ask it of themselves and give the answer twice a day so that they might remember the answer. And this little practice of uh, question and answer as a way of reminding ourselves of the great things in life, it remind, reminds me uh, of a, something a wise teacher of mine taught, uh, taught to me, and it was he taught it out of the depth of wisdom that one finds in searching for an answer that it is dependent upon the quality of questions that we ask of ourselves. I, I was curious by the type of quality of questions the world was asking of itself, and by the world, you can get a good sense of it because we've got Google now, right? Of course, today there are many questions about coronavirus prompted by the fear of catching it, right? I was surprised also to find that one of the most asked questions was how to tie a tie. I, I was specifically looking if there was a question similar to the one the lawyer asked Jesus. And outside of theological colleges and perhaps church sermons on Sunday morning, uh, there was not. So it's not a question that the average person is asking themselves much. No one asked what is the greatest commandment of life, the greatest law of life. Or what is the first spiritual truth of life? No one asked the question, what is love? And that's kind of puzzling uh, because the popular imagination is filled with love songs on the radio and all kinds of opinions about love. We generally have a lack of knowledge about what it is, the DNA of love the spirit of love, right? There is no required university or senior high school courses on love. And I'm not talking about sex education, okay? There are plenty of courses about human rights and laws. There are plenty of courses on social ideologies, but there are no courses that one, that ask the fundamental question, what is love, or give an answer to that outside of theological schools, perhaps. There are no courses that said, what does it require of me? We are well educated in everything but love, so thank God we have Jesus to educate us. When the lawyer asks Jesus the question, what is the greatest commandment? He is asking for a summary statement of Jesus's argument because the lawyer thinks this is about the law thinks this is a legal argument, right? Jesus, you have said much to us about God and the law. Can you summarize the basic principle of your argument, the one on which our lives together depend? What exactly defines our greatest good or the right things we must do to meet the requirements, to obey the commandments, the law? You know I'm talking about Torah, right? The lawyer was asking a legal question, and Jesus gives instead a lesson about love. The Lord began his response, we heard, with a standard answer that all Jews who knew the Torah were expected to respond. It's like learning to respond to four when someone asks the question, what is two plus two? I hope most people still respond four today, otherwise I'm really out of touch. Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. In other words, with all you are as a person, heart, mind, strength. Heart is not just the emotion in the Gospels, in the, in, in, in the Bible. It's the will to do the will of God. And strength refers to our physical being, for we are members of the kingdom through our bodies. We act on our wills. And our mind is the, is the 
place where we reason the will of God. In other words, with all who you are as a person, Jesus says, not just your gut instinct, use your mind to think about it, let your thinking about God be transformed to a will to love. Let your body become the place where the power of God's love is turned into the acts of love in the world we inhabit. And so Jesus was quoting, and I think probably most of us here know it, from Deuteronomy 6.4. The lawyer expected this answer from Jesus. For the Pharisees believed that the idea of God and the idea of the moral law are not separable. They're inseparable. You shall love the Lord your God. Every faithful Jew memorized this commandment. It was called the Shema. And the Shema is an unequivocal statement of faith that God is the ultimate source of truth, goodness, justice, and beauty. And when we see the spirit of all these things, truth, goodness, justice, and beauty, we say God is love. And so Jesus agrees with Tarama. He's got no issue with Torah. Love the Lord your God. But it was also a way of guarding the heart against idolatry, was it not? Idolatry, it means the same thing as it did in the first century, the same today as it was in the first century. It is the worship and love of anything but God who is love. It is the worship of money, perhaps, of sex, of power, of political ideology. It can even be the worship of justice that is godless. For what is justice without God? What is that except the will of the powerful to lord over whoever they can by force? To love God. It corrects the error in thinking that the church can love people without actually loving God. And why? Well, in the New Testament, the word agape describes the unconditional and selfless love of God for us in Christ, right? The word always links love of others with the nature of God's absolute love for us. Agape compels the human spirit to think deeply about the question, what is the greatest love possible to know, even if I cannot possibly live this love well in my own life? To know uh, the, the greatest love possible helps us to know the truth, the beauty, the goodness, and justice of God to know God's love. And when we strive to know agape, we find ourselves reaching for answers in our human spirit that is beyond ourselves because we cannot love like that well. We find ourselves reaching and longing for the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of God's love, that spirit that is beyond us and yet is interacting with us every day. It is like Jacob's ladder in the Old Testament, right? Where angels, he saw angels ascending and descending. It was the link between heaven and earth. It is agape, it is agape. That's the link between heaven and earth. The selfless sharing of the divine spirit, agape. It is justice, it is truth, it is beauty, it is goodness of God. This is God's love. To know it is to know Christ. God's love took refuge amongst us human beings in Christ. And if we have ever asked ourselves the question in a moment of angst, a moment of fear, is there anyone out there holding me in love while I try to hold the people around me? The answer is not maybe. The answer is not I doubt it. The answer is not I don't know. The answer is yes. For the word of God became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The beauty, the truth, the justice, and the goodness of God. And divine love embraced human being by becoming human being. And the Apostle Paul describes the divine embrace of Christ with a question, a deep question, who shall separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Nothing shall separate us on heaven or on earth from Christ Jesus our Lord. And what then have we experienced, friends, in Jesus? We have, because of his agape for us, experienced the unconditional beauty, truth, goodness, and justice of God's love for us. 
So the Bible is clear on this point, though the world is confused, and though we in the church are often confused. You cannot know the spirit of beauty, truth, justice, and goodness without putting your trust that God's love is all these things. And idolatry is looking for justice, truth, goodness, and beauty, or the spirit of love in all the wrong places. And idolatry perverts love. Idolatry destroys the beauty, truth, justice, and goodness of God with us and in us and amongst us. Some of you might be familiar with the folk poem, First They Came. It was a post-World War II poem written by a German Lutheran pastor, Martin Niemöller, uh, who died in 1984. And of course, he was in Germany when Hitler was coming to power, and it is about the indifference of ordinary Germans to the rise of Hitler's political ideology and Nazi party to power in the 30s. How under the guise of justice for Germany, Hitler used his ideology as pretense to exterminate one group of people after another because he didn't think they were necessary for the nation to prosper. And Niemöller's poem went like this. First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. People who espouse ideas that seek justice or beauty or goodness or truth without loving God end up perverting the very things they want, justice, beauty, truth, and goodness for all of us. And that's why that's the first and greatest commandment. Thou shalt love God and have no other gods before thee. And one only has to look at the carnage in some of the most progressive cities in North America today to see this. For if God is not loved, then all that remains is our will to seek our own good, our own justice, our own beauty, and to pat ourselves on the back and call ourselves good. And Jesus had a term for that in the Gospels, right, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees who constantly tried to entrap him in the law. He called them self-righteous hypocrites. So when Christians strive to discern the truth, the just, the good, and the beautiful, then we are not only debating one another's ideas on things, we are intentionally seeking to know the will of God revealed in Christ. For Christ never did anything to satisfy himself. Whatever he did, he did to reveal the truth and justice and beauty and goodness of his Father in heaven. So when Christians speak of God's love, when we come together to wrestle with the deep questions of life, we are struggling to do God's will for the sake of glorifying beauty, God's beauty, justice, truth, and goodness in the world. We're not even doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for the glory of God. We love God because God is the spirit of beauty, truth, justice, and goodness. And we can't reach it on our own, it must be revealed to us by the Spirit, by Christ, by the Word. And once we've been touched by it, though, we can't go back. And Jesus could have stopped right there with his answer. So I've only preached on half of what he said. You shall love the Lord your God, right? And Jesus could have stopped right there with his answer. But he added the scripture from Leviticus 19.18. You shall also love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor. John uh, Killinger, he's, uh, uh, he wrote a book in the late 90s. I, I, I commend it to you. It's, it's called Very Easy to Read, Very Deep, Very Thoughtful. It's called If Christians Really Were Christians. It's a question and answer type book. So each chapter asks a question, and then he provides a reflection as part of the answer. And it's, a, it's a, for Christians who want to dive more deeply into the question of the Christian who seeks to know the beauty justice, goodness, and truth of God. And question nine in Killinger's book is this. What if Christians really love everybody, love their neighbors, right? He said, uh, uh, he tells a story because he likes to tell stories. 
And they are often better than theology, right? He said, I knew a woman who divorced her husband after eight years because he was not successful enough for her. She told the man's mother, well, all you did was teach him how to love, but you did not teach him to get along in the world. She was more interested in what she could wring out of her relationship than what she could put into it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, Jesus says. She did not love God, so the only thing she knew about love was satisfying herself first. How do we know God desires us to love our neighbor? Well, Jesus gave us uh, an example of human dignity that we did not get ourselves. He gave it to us from the cross. He said, this is how God's love is. This is a God thing. And you know, the apostolic community, the first church, they never lost sight of the requirement that the love of God meant the same thing as loving your neighbor in the way that Christ loved us. Timothy 1.5, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, motivated by selflessness, and a good conscience and a sincere trust that God is love. Romans 13.19, he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Colossians, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the unifying bond of completeness. Completeness between God, completeness between us, heaven and earth kiss. Corinthians 12, right, and 13, love is patient, love is kind, and it is not envious. Love does not brag, and it is not arrogant. Well, this completes Jesus' answer. He says to the Pharisee, the two loves are inseparable. For the grace of God is the eternal and indestructible cord that binds heaven and earth together in love. Grace of God wills them to be one commandment. And Jesus is now speaking under his own authority, right? There's no precedent now. He's moving away from the law and the precedents in the law, and he's creating precedent. And that's why he is the Lord, of course. And we know him to be the Lord. And the tension now between the lawyer's commandment and Jesus' answers is more evident. At the heart of the lawyer's question is the human interpretation of religious law. And Jesus says the heart of the law, the heart of the very words of life that God gave Moses on the mountain, the ten words of life, the ten commandments, the foundation of the law of God is the spirit of God's love. And Jesus says divine and human, in his answer to the Pharisee, Jesus says divine and human love must flow freely between heaven and earth. They cannot be separated. And it was not the answer the lawyer was expecting, expecting or even welcoming. The lawyer talks about the religious law as the foundation of a just society. And Jesus points to the heart of the law and says God's love is the foundation. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, if, if before our daily interactions we spend some time in prayer asking ourselves the lawyer's question and then seeking to trust Jesus' answer, then our world and our individual relationships would be more just, more beautiful, more fullness of truth and goodness. Friends, Christ reveals the beauty, the truth, the justice and goodness of God's own loves. He is the love of heaven that flowed out of, the, out of eternity into humanity and his, his spirit of love is, is with us. And the will of God is to love us as pure gift, right? And that's the definition of grace. And Jesus is the gift. And he loved us without concern for his own self-interest or preservation. And this is God's love. And when we encounter the love of God in Christ, one is, is utterly undone or overcome by the beauty, the goodness, the truth, and the justice of him who went to his death out of love for us. We are undone by it. We are undone in spirit by the total lack of selfishness. And then we realize our challenge as Christians, as individuals, and as a church of those who profess to follow this love. The struggle to love in this world is not about becoming divine like Jesus, but more fully human like him. To love in the spirit of Christ is to allow the love of heaven to flow through us. 
And God's will to love is done in our will to love as Christ loved us. And upon this truth hangs all the words of the prophets and the theologians and the preachers and the lay people and anyone who professes love for Christ and who professes to follow him. So brothers and sisters in Christ, can you hear the Lord speaking his answer now to your heart, to, to our hearts here in Westmount? Hear, O Westmount congregation, love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. Everything on heaven and in earth and on earth depend upon it. And Jesus, may all the love that is in you flow into us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Share our burdens and let me share others too. Thanks be to God. Amen. occurred to me listening to that uh, that great song uh, by Sean, that great uh, heartfelt song that came right from your your heart, uh, how it uh, stirred me in joy, my own heart and joy. And it just it just compels me to uh, to invite you to um, turn to the person maybe sitting beside you or across from you. And of course, we're all social distancing here, and just uh, offer them a, a sign a sign of Christ's peace, an acknowledgement that we are here uh, in His spirit and that he is here with us so peace peace be with you peace be with you let us pray dear lord it's uh, hard for us as human beings not to worry about the basics of life, work and money, food and health, weather and crops, war and politics, health and sickness. Those things overwhelm us. And so we're, we're just glad that we can take time out from those basic things and we can ask us about the nature of love. What it means to be loved by you, what it means to love someone else. 
Help us to see that this question that Jesus answers today about love orders all the other questions we have about ourselves and our health, about others. By the power of your spirit, continue to place on our hearts these types of questions once in a while. For they put our lives in perspective. O oh Lord, send us your spirit in our life this week. Shower us with your beauty and justice and truth and goodness that we might see and know your love working in us. And we might be more sensitive then to those around us. We might reveal the nature of it to them. We might love them more selflessly. Oh Christ, though there are many things that happen to us that are beyond our understanding, grant us faith to reason that you are guiding our lives, that we are in your care always. Lord, if we are unsure or tired of putting one foot in front of the next in the challenges of our day, may the loving voice of your Spirit speak through the Gospel. Lead us and encourage us to trust in you, to find our strength in your grace. Lord, thank you for revealing to us that our lives are precious to you. Please heal us and your world of both its spiritual idolatry and human suffering. In particular, we ask that your healing and consolation be upon Ruth and Eric Kevin and Kyle today. We ask it in the name of Jesus that you bring them healing and you bring them peace. Lord, your, your son, he invited us to enter into the kingdom, to remember its nature and our duty in it through the prayer that he gave us. And I'd invite you to say the prayers you were able through your masks. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And friends, May your hearts find peace, may your souls know rest, may your minds be renewed by the great love of God who comes to us in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Go from this place, loved by our God, and do all the good you can. In Jesus' name, Amen.